So now that we've talked about uh, the attachment to everything, so what are some of these uh, the psychological effects that occur when we become psychologically attached to our social media apps? And that first bullet point is uh, when we're connected or we're, we're constantly connected to social media, it's this always on toll, as some call it, meaning that our minds don't completely go to rest or never completely remove from the outside world, whether that outside world be work, whether that outside world be um, you know, things that are going on in, in groups or at school or whatever, that we can't enjoy the moment. People can't just live in the moment, that their mind is always being drawn back to other things. The second one, and I think this is a really interesting um, piece, is being connected via social media can give the potential illusion that your life is very social. You have lots of friends, you have lots of communications going on, you're always communicating with others. But when you remove that face-to-face -face aspect from it, there is not the emotional nourishment that goes on in the digital communications as there are being front and center with someone, laughing with them, hearing their voices, touching them. And that is something that people are beginning to look at to say, does that, is that something that in our youth, particularly our college age individuals, that they think they have a very good social life and friendships and they may have those communications, but they're not getting that nourishment. You know, a third piece of this, and I think this is probably one of the more important pieces, is there is a significant amount of association and links between um, social media use and compromised sleep. And that compromised sleep either being less sleep because they're staying up later uh, looking at, uh, at social media and or the compromised sleep disturbances during the middle, middle of the evening, the middle of the night, waking up and deciding they need to check something. And as you can probably guess, when you don't get enough sleep, that leads uh, to the inability to handle a lot of the daily pressures and stresses. The self-presentation concerns, um, this happens in a couple of different ways, but one is even if you just think now of someone, and particularly college age, and posting the selfies, the number of pictures that it takes to get that one picture that you want to display to the world and what that looks like. This is kind of mirrored from the fact that you know, when we're looking at our social media feeds, we're basically seeing curated lives of everyone else. So everyone else has presented their way in their best light possible, showing their highlight reel, which also leads us to believe that everyone else's life is so great because, oh, they got married and they're going on a vacation and they've got a new puppy and, you know, this great thing and this great thing. And hours made dull in comparison. The constant negativity, which is, should not be surprising, particularly as we think about the political nature it is today. Uh, social media has been contributing to what people have said as the polarization of America, meaning it drives people to one side or to the other. And there is no getting away from it. If you are on social media, it is there front and center every day, 24 hours, day, seven days a week. And then the last bullet point, which is a very important bullet point, and this, when, when we talk about cyberbullying, um, I think we can look at this in many different ways. There are several you know, unfortunate cases to where individuals um, have been picked out and bullied behind the scenes via social media. But there's also the more subtle types of cyberbullying that occurs that may be, maybe not even be intentional. And that's cyberbullying, meaning in the fact of conversations that occur online where someone thinks they are talking about them when maybe that other party is talking about someone else. Or seeing pictures to where someone has been excluded from um, an activity that they thought they wanted to be in. So the cyberbullying is not just maybe that direct aggression towards someone, but also that indirect stuff that occurs. 
So now as we transfer to transition to the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Primack for a few minutes to talk about some of the specific research he's done. Thanks so much, Jeff. And that was a really excellent introduction to all of the various issues around social media and mental health. And given that background, we thought that it would be particularly important to conduct the first very large scale epidemiologic association study between social media exposure and depression, anxiety, loneliness, other outcomes that are important to us as clinicians. So what I've done here is put up the background of the results of our study, but without the actual data, just to sort of introduce the variables and to tell you a little bit about what we were thinking as we were designing this study. So you can see along the x-axis the quartiles of media uh, social media exposure, with quartile four being the highest social media exposure, quartile one being the lowest. As we saw before, the average social media exposure is uh, about two and a little bit more hours, so you can imagine what those quartiles ended up uh, to be. Over in quartile four, we're talking more about like three to four and plus hours a day of social media use. Quartile one, we're talking about, you know, no social media use to maybe 30, 40 minutes, um, that kind of thing. Um, on the y-axis, we see the odds ratio for depression. And what we used for this study, uh, you know, there are many different measures, of course, for um, assessing depression, and we used the PROMISE scale, um, you know, which uh, I'll let you look up, but it, it's a pretty well-validated instrument and developed by uh, an NIH roadmap initiative. Um, the other thing that I'll mention here is that we did this study with a, a large group, about 2,000 um, young adults. We really focused on the 18 to 30 year old population because, um, uh, because we've just seen so many concerns in this particular age group in terms of increases in suicide and as we saw earlier, heavy social media use. That being said, you know, it is important to look at similar similar relationships for other age groups, and, and we can talk a little bit more about that later. So when we set out to do this study, we did have a hypothesis, was which was that we would have sort of a U-shaped curve. In other words, we thought that people using almost no social media over in quartile one, they might actually be a little bit more likely to be depressed. You know, they might not be having that sort of normative social media exposure. The people in quartiles two and three, we thought might have uh, lower odds for depression because those people are having sort of those, all those connections, you know, after all, they've got, you know, hundreds of friends, quote unquote. Uh, and then in quartile four, for people that are using, you know, very extreme amounts of social media, we thought we might see a higher risk for depression. In this study, we are controlling for basically all of the demographic information that is important to control for sex, race, education, living situation, employment, um, and a, a couple of other uh, demographic variables in addition. So then if we advance to the next slide, we see what we actually found with regard to um, these data, and you can see that it's very different than our U-shaped uh, hypothesis. This is obviously a straight line. Um, statistically, that it, it it is linear, and um, so th this uh, begs the question of why are we not seeing um, more benefits to at least some social media exposure? When we saw those results, we said, well, you know, the next thing to look at would be instead of depression and anxiety, and for anxiety, we showed, you know, a very similar relationship 
we decided to look at perceived social isolation um, or loneliness. We thought to ourselves, well, maybe people are, you know, more depressed and anxious, but at least maybe people with more social media exposure are, um, they're feeling more socially connected. Uh, you know, maybe for some reason that's not necessarily translating into less depression, less anxiety. Um, and so that's why we thought it would be important to look at this relationship. And again, we hypothesized that there would be more of a nuanced uh, relationship here um, as opposed to what we actually found. So if we advance to the next slide, you see that here as well, we end up with basically a, a straight line uh, demonstrating that the more social media someone is exposed to, the higher their odds for um, feeling socially isolated. Perceived social isolation is a distinct construct from actual social isolation. In other words, somebody might perceive that they're very isolated, but if you actually followed them around on a day-to-day -day basis, you would see that they have a lot of connections. Similarly, there are a lot of people who um, feel like they, um, you know, like they're just fine. They don't feel that they're socially isolated, but they don't have that many um, true connections. And the reason why we did this study with perceived social isolation um, as opposed to actual social isolation is that perceived social isolation is actually much more connected with some of the problematic um, outcomes that we see like suicide. At this point, um, I want to go ahead and acknowledge that very important caveat that Jeff brought up in his introduction, which is that these are um, cross-sectional data. And so what we're seeing here are associations. We are not necessarily saying that the social media is causing the social isolation or the depression. And it could be in either direction. So for example, you certainly could take some of the information that Jeff described earlier and say, well, if someone is exposed to more social media, that very well might actually, um, you know, paradoxically make them feel like they're more isolated. It might make them feel like they don't measure up uh, you know, to all of the curated beautiful images and, and lives that people uh, tend to portray on social media, and so it might actually make them feel uh, worse about themselves, more depressed, more anxious. Um, on the other hand, what we may be seeing here is that people who are more depressed, more anxious, more socially isolated are simply reaching out through social media, and so actually the arrow may be going um, in the other direction. Um, people, you know, feel um, anhedonic, they're, you know, not going to go out socially, um, it just is taking too much energy, and so instead they reach for that social media that makes things a little bit, um, you know, that, that's, that's easier to do than to actually get yourself, you know, out to a coffee shop with a friend or something like that. And even though there have not been um, very well conducted studies that look longitudinally because these are are very you know challenging to do they are in process and some of the initial results suggest that the arrow does go in both directions and you can sort of imagine that this is something that is very common to see in social science in general and you can see how uh, that vicious cycle may occur in this particular uh, milieu. So for example, we can imagine someone with a little bit of depression who you know, is not doing more fulfilling in-person uh, kinds of social activities. They're reaching for social media because it's easy, um, but then the social media doesn't necessarily give them that deep fulfillment that they are looking for. And in fact, for all the reasons that Jeff described earlier, it may actually be making them feel a little bit worse about their situation, um, which then leads them to more depression. 
um, less uh, likelihood of reaching out in certain ways and then more social media exposure so you know that is definitely um, something that we are concerned about